Welcome back, everyone. Uh, now we have an expert panel, and uh, we're going to have a discussion around dispenser concerns, what they've seen. And so we have some some very unique perspectives here. We have uh, Dr. Connie Young from Senior Advisor for Policy and U.S. Food and Drug Administration. You heard from Connie earlier today. Uh, Eric Marshall, uh, Principal of Eleven Partners and Executive Director of the Partnership for DSCSA Governance, PDG. Dave Mason, Supply Chain Compliance and Serialization Lead, Novartis Pharmaceutical Co Corporation, and Max Peoples, CEO of ArcScan and Uptown and Accentra Pharmacies. So we've got an interesting group here. We've got uh, regular FDA, Connie. We have Dave from, from a manufacturing point of view, Max from a pharmacy and also solution point of view, and Eric, who's been working with, with PDG across the supply chain uh, to, do, to develop uh, uh, areas around interoperability. So thanks everyone for, for being part of this. Maybe we can do is uh, first take a look at, um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about uh, what you hear from the dispenser community in terms of issues or, or struggles they may be having or concerns. So do you want me to start, uh, Bob? I can start. So um, just to let the uh, audience know, my responsibility right now is um, we're starting to, um, we do the artists slash Sandoz. So we have a generic and an IM arm of the business. And we are, we are starting to onboard customers for uh, data exchange. And that includes in our business model, many dispensers. So we have sent, sent letters out to many dispensers about the onboarding process. And what we're, what we're hearing is, uh, one, we're not hearing, uh, some dispensers we're not hearing from at all uh, because they didn't realize this is a regulation and that it, it, it's, it's a year away. So we're having our commercial team, we have developed a slide deck for our commercial team to engage those dispensers and give them a short education on the, what's required and and how they can uh, set up for us. The other thing we're hearing from the dispensers we hear, uh, they they can't they are not sophisticated, so they are not being able to exchange EPCS messages. So what we have done is we have several ways of doing it uh, based off the FDA 24 guidance, which is email, portal, or in in of course the uh, more sophisticated. AS2 connection, but we we are setting up a lot of our smaller dispensers in the portal so they can get uh, access to data when they need it, either in a PDF or an XML file. So we're giving them several types of, uh, of things. The other thing is a lot of our dispenser community do not have uh, technical resources on site or um, also um, they're, so we are providing our, our technical resources to help guide them through the processes. So we, we are, it, what, right now we're in a, a phase with a lot of our dispensers, and I'm talking smaller, mid-sized, smaller dispensers. We actually do ship to them. Our larger retail and institutional dispensers have teams, have service providers, things like that, and they, they still are requiring technical expertise from us to help understand what the requirements like what you know, EPCS messages, what a credential is, or what a, a a certificate is, because when you do a direct connection, you need certificates. How to access the portal? How long will our data be there? So we're 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 doing a lot of education right now, and and technical support to uh, onboard these dispensers. So I, it kind of went over at very high level, but that's kind of where we are from a dispenser. Uh, process and and I knock I knock the dispensers. I know this is specifically a dispenser form, but the dispensers shouldn't feel bad. I have a lot of uh, distributors in the same uh, situation, especially smaller distributors. Mm -hmm. So we made it a, a a consorted effort with our commercial team, our trade team, our technical team, and our serialization team to reach out and help educate, help support and make sure they are compliant to receive the important drugs they need to for their patients in 2023. Good. Thanks, Doug. Eric, maybe I, can, maybe I can throw it to you a bit. I, I know you're speaking tomorrow, so I don't want you to give away all your secrets. But uh, 
I know that you know maybe you could touch base from a PDG perspective and this the dispenser community what's been taking mm-hmm. place. Yeah, happy to Bob. And you know uh, maybe I'll put it into three categories. I think one concern we continue to hear is one right that Dave touched on. I think many folks have right uh, the the no response right the people who just aren't engaged uh, at all. And there's kind of a, a next bucket of folks who are aware that there's something there that they need to be doing and they're starting to, to you know, come up to speed and play a little bit of catch up. You know, I think the most common question and area of emphasis that we hear uh, and get questions around there is much more in kind of that, what does this mean for my receiving process um, that kind of space, particularly, you know, this question of, uh, does this mean I have to start scanning everything or can't to the other end of the spectrum, right? Of geo, can I just let my wholesaler take care of this for me? And we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, as you said, but kind of that piece about what does this mean for my receiving process, I think is kind of what I, I tend to hear the most from those who are somewhat up to speed and getting engaged. And then the third bucket, you know, of those dispensers who really are engaged and are much deeper and more prepared for this, um, I think the two questions that I get most often, one is those product flows where ownership and possession kind of diverge, right? So drop ships, 340B, uh, consignment, uh, they don't really diverge, but direct ships, all of those kind of non-traditional pathways, even though they're, you know, far from from being unique. Uh, they're quite common. I think understanding those flows is one that we get a lot. And you know, with your help, Bob, obviously our, our group has been putting together some detailed functional designs and flows around that that'll be coming out in new chapters of our blueprint in a few weeks. Um, and then the other one is GLN actually. Uh, we, I continue to get a lot of questions from dispensers just about, do I really need a GLN? Is somebody gonna give me a GLN? What if I don't have a GLN? Uh, is just a, a space that continues to come up a lot. Terrific, Connie. Maybe I'll, from a regulatory perspective, are you hearing some repeating themes from the dispenser community? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I I don't want to sound repetitive. I think um, <laughs> they <laughs> and Eric have captured, and I know Max has also shared some in different venues as well. Um, you know, it's a challenging thing because it's the supply chain is so large, right? And the dispensers technically are at the end of the supply chain um, right before the drugs are going to, you know, reach the patients. They also have a lot of th- other things that they're doing, um, but they are part of the supply chain. And, um, and, you know, it's it's part of their responsibility to be part of that. And, and, and contribute to supply chain integrity. So hopefully, you know, uh, forums like this, and I, I know that different stakeholders are trying really hard. I mean, Dave, you just mentioned about, you know, you, the information you're gonna put for your teams to do um, the outreach and education, other organizations, there's there's resource, some, there's so many resources out there. So I'm just, I'm kind of wondering, um, I'm not sure what the answer is, is you know how how are we how are we missing certain um, dispensers from um, you, you know either even just teaching them as there's that one group you know that one group of entities that just aren't aware. I mean we are pretty far along. I know I've been talking for the last nine years about this. <laughs> I go to venues that are specific to pharmacies and dispensers. We have stuff on our website. You know why is it that we aren't reaching those those entities? I don't know the answer. So if anybody has advice, um, you know, I'd be glad to hear that too. Well, well Max, I've, I've saved you for last because you are a dispenser. You are that, that entity that <laughs> you've lived the life of a dispenser. No. Uh, maybe you could provide some insight into uh, your, your end of the supply chain. Well, part of it is my colleagues are just swamped with daily patient care issues. Um, and, and, and they were doubly swamped, obviously, over the last couple of years. Would you look at the hundreds of millions of vaccination doses that, you know, the community pharmacies provided and so forth. So um, something that was a couple of years off just didn't make it even to the pile, let alone to the bottom of the pile. Um, and so now we're, we're within a year and everybody's diligently trying to get them on board, trying to get them through. 
but like right now, my own pharmacies, they are swamped with vaccinations. Um, and so that, that this kind of a topic just doesn't rise to the level of importance. It will hit next year. The trouble, of course, is such a small window then to get everything done. Um, I'm going to make a pitch tomorrow about the industry helping to develop a SOP template that um, dispensers can draw on um, for reasons that I'll go over tomorrow. Um, the, the GLNs are, are a real issue. You know, there's talk about how a lot of times our GPOs that we belong to have GLNs. Well, I reached out to my GPO two weeks ago and haven't heard back yet. Um, I talked to a hospital. Um, they went searching with one of their big GPOs. Um, they have one GLN, but they're trying to figure out where it was really assigned to and so forth. Um, the, the, the distributors, the big, dis, big distributors um, are all doing us dispensers a huge savings. They've, they've uh, worked with GS1 to get GLNs assigned and make sure we don't have doubles and triples and, you know, four different GLNs for the same location and so forth. Um, we need that accelerated. We need those numbers to get released. Um, because fortunately for us, we've actually been able to start to onboard with one of the major distributors with the EPCIS. That's the new data file that's going to come across that was talked about earlier today. Well, there's a lot of work to do to get those files um, into the hands of pharmacies to make sure that the data is available. Because we cannot pass a drug on to a patient if we don't have the data. Now, in our SLPs, we're going to have to put in if, ands, and buts about that because we're not going to want to deny, we're not going to go into shortages on products because we've got a data flow issue here in the first months um, after November when this all kicks off. But the manufacturers and distributors have had several years to get EPCAS data transfer done between themselves. And the distributors today will tell us, well, maybe 30% of the manufacturers are sending EPCAS data to them. And of that, they're not sending all of their products with EPCS data. So there's still work to be done there. Um, I was speaking with a couple of the distributors here recently, and they said if they don't get the EPCIS from the manufacturers, then they're not going to have any EPCIS to pass on to, the, to the, the dispensers. So there is a lot of stuff to be done. Um, we're we're kind of all aware of it, and that's why this meeting was put together to try and get more awareness out there, get more people on board. Um, and we're just going to move forward. But um, I'm hoping that and I, one of my plugs for the industry developed SOP is it's a great educational tool. If we put together a really good template that takes in all parties information, we don't want dispensers expecting actions from a distributor from a manufacturer that they're not going to provide. Um, and so if everybody gets together and puts together a really good template, then it's a great educational tool. Um, I'm giving up some of my speech for tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe we can op also open it up to the audience if anybody has, has a question for our panel or if the panelists have any, any uh, discussion or rebuttal, if you will. <laughs> can, I add, can I add some uh, comments, yeah. uh, basically, for Max and, and people? So, the big three are working with community uh, are doing the community pharmacy GLN assignment. I know GLN is important. And then GS1 is currently working to make sure there's no duplicates. And all this will be uh, updated in the US Data Hub. And, and our plan is, um, and there's some service providers that you don't need a GLN to actually push a message. But our plan is, from a Novartis Sandoz perspective, if our customer dispenser customer does not have a GLN and is not registered in the U.S. data hub, we have purchased a GCP to, uh, to assign them a GLN, and then we will upload with their name and address and upload it into, their, into the data hub for them and provide the certificate to them so we can exchange data, right? And because and there's some service providers who can exchange data without a GLN, there's others that can't. For EPCS, you need a GLN. That is the, the GS1 regulation, but we're but what we're trying to do is be flexible because not every I know EPCS is the message of choice, and I agree with that. But not every dispenser is going to be able to handle that because of their technology. So that's why we have a portal that will allow us 
for them to pull a PDF or some other type of, of format that they can use. Even our our our, um, our um, portal will keep the data for the required six years. So if, if the if the Board of Pharmacy or the FDA comes in and asks a question, they can pull that data at, at, at within the six years of, of that. So. I agree with Max. There's a lot of education. The issue with manufacturers, many are still doing their aggregation. Uh, I will tell you where we are. We are getting ready to update our DCs that will be turned on in the first quarter of 23, and we will start exchanging data. And Max is absolutely correct. We will we will go through a transition of of the EPCS message will not have all the uh, TI in it until November 23 because we're working through non-aggregated product, right? The lot level is still, and this should be important to dispensers, the lot level is still the compliance rule until November 27, 2023. And that's important to let them know. I don't want them to panic because they're getting partial e EPCS or serial number TI. My, my thing to the dispensers are, and we're working very closely with our and I hope other manufacturers and, and distributors are too. The education is important, but understanding what what type of file they can handle. So yes, EPCS is kind of going to be 90, 95 percent of the supply chain, but you're going to have people that can't that can't handle that because of their size and their technology. So that's what we looked at to make sure everybody can get the data they need. Thought oh, Bob, I just wanted to add that to Max's thing because what Max said is 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 agreeable. I think there's manufacturers behind. Uh, everybody should be everybody should be building manufacturers, especially wholesalers, distributors should be building and be in the process of turning on their systems in the first quarter. If not, there's going to be some difficulty. Okay, the systems are the, all the service providers have the inoperable systems. It's just a matter of Selecting one if you need a service provider and, and, and getting your work done. Hmm. So, and I know the dispensers are all relying on us. <laughs> if if I may butt in here, um, there was a question in the chat uh, as a private message, but I think it was mm -hmm. meant for everyone. How prepared for DSDSA do you find the dental industry dispensers and distributors? Dentists prescribe. Well, let's stun everyone. It's interesting. Um, we don't have specific, you know, I know the uh, dentists use drugs, but uh, we don't have any specific distributors that, that we go with dental products. I distribute it by other distributors. Um, well, and they yeah. may fall under the exemption, um, depending, they may fall under the exemption um, under dis the dispenser definition. So if they're, um, you know, authorized by law to dispense or administer drugs, uh, you know, but they're not a pharmacy, they they are exempt from um, product tracing. That makes sense. They they still will will they still fall under the EPCAS um, documentation requirements? They still need to receive that information. Well, technically, if you look at that exemption, I believe it exempts them from verification and product tracing requirements. It doesn't exempt them from authorized trading partner and requirements related to the product identifier, meaning you should have you should be using products that are supposed to have a product identifier. So technically, just like maybe you could think it like I, I, I vision a, a dentist sort of like a doctor's office. You know, a doctor is also legally uh, allowed to um, administer drugs to patients. They all fall, would fall under that exemption. But Connie, let me ask you a question. What I understand is when we do dispense to doctor's offices, maybe some of them are dentists, but we also dispense to specific vet companies, but the product is human. It, it doesn't say for vet use only. We see us as a manufacturer. We're not exempt. We still have to build the PI uh, in, in to that to that exempt entity, and that's how yes. we interpret the law. Yes, right. That sounds right. Um, 
Yes, and especially because it's um, a human drug, um, it doesn't, just because if it's a human drug used for animals doesn't make it exempt. It's still a human drug. So until it, say, gets to that, maybe a vet, and the vet is giving it to a animal patient, then, you know, that's not within scope of DSCSA. But because it's a human drug, and as, as long as it's manufactured and it's distributed, those would all still fall under DSCSA requirements. I think there's an area where a lot of medical offices may not realize that they're going to fall under some of these rules is the folks that are like participating in a 340B purchasing programs. So they're not licensed as pharmacies in the state, but they are purchasing and dispensing drugs to patients. Patients take them home, it's being dispensed by the nurse or whatever. Um, so I think they need to very closely um, work with their legal counsel to see which part of DSCSA they're going to fall under. Yeah, right. That's really good advice, Max, because just because you may be some entity under a program, whether it's 340B or something else, remember what I said before, it's about the activities that you're performing. If you are taking ownership of a drug or you are selling, you know, transferring the ownership to another um, entity, uh, you'll really need to look closely at your activities and see whether those fall under one of the trading partner activities, such as wholesale distribution. So I, I know that in 2024, or we'll have the playbook that we can tell dispensers exactly what to do. But uh, are there are there resources? You know that that what's the best way for a dispenser to kind of sift through all this? I know there's, there's a lot of information and then converting that information to what is it that I actually have to put in play? You know, Max, I don't want to do, do your whole thing uh, tomorrow about, about the SOP, but um, maybe a little bit about how to, as a dispenser, translate the requirements, translate the systems that are available to what I need to do in, in my operation. So, you know, there's some great resources, obviously, NCPA serves as a great resource. Um, HDA has a website, I believe it's dscsa.pharmacy. Um, it's got a great list of resources. Um, I would really familiarize with those different documents that are in there. Obviously, read the regulations. Um, but, of course, the regulations are not the easiest to understand if you're not maybe a lawyer or have dealt a lot with the way regulations and legalese is written and so forth. Um, start reaching out to the partners that you have now. Understand what your suppliers are going to be providing to you, what their options are, and so forth. And then taking a look at, uh, I, I know, I just know personally that most pharmacies today do not have as standard operating procedures um, concerning DSCSA requirements that are in effect today. Um, many of them are not following what they're required to do today. Um, and part of that's because there hasn't been anybody really, you know, calling them on it, right? Um, we all expect that there's going to be people getting called on the, the carpet, so to speak, starting sometime after next November. And a lot of that's probably going to be your state board of pharmacies. Um, in Ohio, they have a very efficient system here and they've started uh, publishing checklists. Um, and so, like, there's a checklist uh, for community pharmacies. Um, I think it's like 149 pages is long document. I expect um, there's going to be several new pages added to that concerning the DSCSA requirements and stuff. And so the, the inspectors are going to be coming in and they're going to be asking, how do you do this? How do you do that? Show me this, show me that. Um, and for people to understand that, that yes, under the regulations, there are areas where you have 24 hours to respond or you have 48 hours to respond. Well, guess what? If they come in and ask to see your SOPs, that's an immediate request. You don't have 24 or 48 hours. Okay? Also understand that they can ask questions about things that are not necessarily under DSCSA. Um, one of my hopes with the SOP is that it does kind of give some guidelines 
so that the boards of pharmacy, et cetera, the regulators, when they come in and they're claiming it's for DSCSA, because we've put together this really good template as an industry that puts some barriers around what they can do under quote DSCSA. But we as pharmacists need to remember, they also have lots of other authorities that they can come in and ask questions about and require information on. So um, I, 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 again, to go back to Bob's question, um, try and find the time, an hour here, half hour there, start taking a look at um, the documents that are out there at a couple of these websites, great resources. Start thinking about what you're gonna do with your own SOPs, talk to your suppliers, what are they gonna do? Um, and, and, and what of what they're gonna do for you really matches what you need versus what you're gonna need starting next November. Um, the, the suppliers have done a great job. They've really bailed out dispensers in many ways um, over the last several years. It's much harder for them to bail you out in the near future. They can't do your PI verification for you. They can't do their, your tracing for you. Um, so there's things that as dispensers, we're gonna have to know how to do. We're gonna have to have processes in place or systems in place to do these things. And we're just gonna have to do them. Um, and then you need to take a look at the budget and try and figure out how you're gonna do them with the budgets that the most com community pharmacies are operating under. How, um... And we, we've, we've talked about dispensers and, and maybe not understanding the, the, the breadth and depth of the law and what they need to do. Uh, from a pharmacy system perspective, do the, do the existing pharmacy systems, are they aware of the SCSA? Have they taken any steps to either integrate or it seems that that's, that's your first uh, system that you you would be looking at and maybe it, it's a way, it's a, a bridge to the SCSA. So, so I was out at the NCPA recent conference, um, went to the exhibit hall, spoke with many of the different pharmacy software system vendors who were, were there. Um, they're aware, um, but they're not yet building anything in um, mm -hmm. to, 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 you know, assist with a PI verification or assist, assist with a tracing request or to get your EPCIS file and, and, and so forth. Um, I know of one that's come to us to ask us to actually do the EPCS file work for them and then pass it on to them in a more usable format and so forth. Um, so it, it's up in the air. Um, I, I, I think probably some of them maybe are, are waiting for PDG to release the blueprints, okay, that kind of lays out some of this. Um, but it's a very short window for them to be able to actually have something for next November. Um, most of the pharmacy system vendors have spent a lot of time on the clinical side of pharmacy. Really, okay, everything to do with immunizations, everything to do with advanced clinical services, um, whether, you know, uh, uh, comprehensive medication therapy management type of topics. Their, their system is becoming more of an EHR, an electronic health record system, not just a dispensing system. So a lot of their focus has been on those areas. So the DSCSA has kind of been at the bottom of the pile. It, it's, you know, a conversation is my understanding as well. Eric, in, in, in um, again, not to give away your whole talk tomorrow, but in, in the PDG's dispensing group, you know, we hear a lot about borrow and loan and mostly f seems to be mostly from the hospital environment, not necessarily to retail. Is that, is that an area of, of discussion or? Yeah, you know, uh, every time I talk with dispensers, it comes up and I know we're running right up against time here. So I'll say, yeah, I, I will dig into that one a little bit tomorrow. But, you know, one piece I will notice, uh, often I think dispensers get scared that they can't do that. Um, under the DSCSA, I'll say, uh, it's not that uh, you can't do it, uh, but if you're going to engage in that activity in most circumstances, you will need to be able to provide DSCSA data and you're probably going to be required to be licensed as a wholesale distributor. There are some carve outs there, uh, like providing uh, to a, a practitioner for in office use if it's in minimal quantities or specific name patients. And again, I can uh, plan to dig into that a little bit more tomorrow, but I will just say uh, it is a concern. Uh, people are concerned they're not going to be able to do that. And um, there's a balance there that uh, it, it's not prohibited, but you will be need to be in a position to provide data and likely be licensed as a wholesaler outside of some of those specific exemptions. Okay. 
Well, as you said, we're up against our time. Maybe just uh, any final thoughts from our from our panel? Speaking to the Spencer. Um, please attend tomorrow's session. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of very good detail tomorrow for dispensers, absolutely. Yeah, just to remind everyone that we have we have one, two, three, four, four sessions tomorrow. Uh, we'll be doing some deep dives in, into some different areas around standards, around uh, blueprints, and so uh, other areas that we can we can have uh, further discussions on. Hopefully, this helps the dispenser community to have a better understanding of where to go for help and and what resources are available to them. So thanks everyone. Thanks for your your time today. I really appreciate it and look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Thank you.